Welcome back at All Counts family. We have a great guest today, a phenomenal teacher, a wonderful basketball player, a great man that God has done a lot of things in the state of North Carolina. Lavelle Moten, how you doing, man? Quans, what's up, brother? It's a pleasure to be here, bro. <laughs> hey, hey, guys, when you, at All Counts family, when you sit back and, and, and look and listen and read his resume, the time he takes to coach a team he spends a tremendous amount of time with his family. Great in the community, a lot of things. We'll get into that. Uh, I, I, I start to call him Lavelle Superman Moten, but I, I, but I held back <laughs> on the Superman. <laughs> <laughs> you wild for that one, man. Nah. <laughs> hey, hey, Bill, really, 29 points a game mm -hmm. coming out of high school. Why did you choose the HBCU? Man, Kwanzaa, it's, it's crazy because I, I just, um, I had this conversation yesterday with my staff. Um, I would say I didn't even choose the HBCU, man. The HBCU chose me, man. right? Um, I'm here in North Carolina, home state, Raleigh, North Carolina kid. Um, top high school, well-respected. You know, with Danny Young and Nate McMillans and the Chris Wilcoxes, like that, that was our um, culture in, in Enlow High School. So everybody wanted to attend that high school and I was able to do so. Um, and I just wanted to walk in the fo footsteps of the Nate McMillans and the Tony Warrens, whose son is TJ Warren, right? Like all of those guys, they was just from my neighborhood, man. And um, along the way, I was on a, AAU team, which was the number one AAU team in the country. Myself, Jeff Capel, Jeff, Jerry Stackhouse, Chuck Cornegy, like we were loaded and, and mm. you know, we had a great reputation. Um, I wanted to go to NC State at the time because mm. I was a huge Rodney Monroe fan. Mm. And a lot of people don't know this. My first cousin is um, Donald Williams, who ended okay. up attending University of North Carolina. So I was always with him. So I just wanted to follow in his footsteps. I was a year after him. And um NC State was going on probation, man. And Ricky Stokes texted me a couple of days ago, and that's how the conversation came about. Ricky Stokes was at Wake Forest, and he recruited me hard every single day. And he wanted me to sign early, but my high school coach didn't want me to sign early. So come mid-June, I, I waited so late. I waited to, like, late May and June, and um, I wanted to go to Michigan State. Um, mm. And at... I think Judd Heathcote was like he was going to retire at the end of that year. So he wasn't going to be able to see me through. So I was like, good gracious, man. I, now I'm out here stuck. So now it's in June. I called Wake Forest back and they had signed Rusty LaRue, right? Mm -hmm. um, and so they wanted me to go to prep school because I was still young. But in comes HBCU coach uh, Greg Jackson, who was the coach at North Carolina Central. He said, man, I never recruited you because I didn't feel like I had a chance to get you. And he said, um, if you want to come, I love to have you. He sat at my mom's kitchen table in Quans. I, I signed with North Carolina Central, and it's 30 minutes away from my house, but I had never really heard of it and never seen it. Wow. And I signed sight unseen. And I'll never forget my mom telling me, I looked at her. And he, this was back in the day when you could bring the scholarship papers with you, yes, yes. right, to the house. <laughs> and my mom looked and she said, I just don't want you in these projects for another year. Mm. And just so she don't know much about ball, but seeing that expression on her face, I signed right there on the spot. And the next day in the paper, it's like, Moten going to Central, like, you know, it was a big headline. And I just remember praying to God, like, man, please let me like this place. Cause I've never seen it, you know what I'm saying? So I got up there, I loved the gym. And then after my first year, NC State come back because now they're off probation. And I just said, I'm gonna stay down with Central and the rest is history. Now Mo, you grew up in Boston <laughs> and your mom right. moved to Carolina. Why was the move made? Um. It was just too rough at the time. You know, I had a, my mom originally from North Carolina. Okay. Right. So she left at 17, 18. Um, she's from Dunn, North Carolina. It's a, a, it's a quiet country town. Um, so she left at 18 because, you know, back in those days, you would either go to the factory and work mm. or go back out there in the field. She was like, I ain't doing that. So she went to LA, you know, just to see what the world had to offer. And um, I got a brother that's five years older. So she had my brother out in LA and, you know, I think that was a little too fast for for a country girl going to L.A. and, you know, those times. So she was like, man, let me let me get back over here. So I had a she moved to uh, Connecticut and then she moved to Boston. And that's where she had me. And um, 
you know, Boston was an amazing city, man. And like we stayed in the housing projects, the Orchard Park projects, same projects as New Edition. They was in my same mm -hmm. building. And by this time they getting discovered. So now the one thing I'm getting from them is inspiration, yeah. right? A purpose or something to live for. And um, the defining moment to answer your question is um, one night my mom was uh, going to work. She worked every day, but she was like this night in particular. She said, "I'm not, I'm not going." She didn't feel well, so her and my godmom always rode the, the transit together. And the following morning, my godmom was um, duct taped by some gang members and set on fire. Mm. And uh, my mom would have been with her; if she would have went to work. So she said that was her cue and her sign that you know Boston is not the place to raise two young men. And so she migrated to, to Raleigh, North Carolina. Wow. And Phil, how do you get at an HBCU, how do you convince, because you've had a tremendous amount of success, how do you get young men, because you've had guys that come from PWIs, you've recruited guys from PWIs and, and beat people out, how do you convince them that your situation is better? That's a great question, man. I, I think at the end of the day, it's one thing to sell, but it's another thing to be genuine. Mm -hmm. You know, and I, I never wanted to, come across as a as a used car salesman because I'm from the neighborhood where everybody, you know, you, you if nothing else, you have the di gift of discernment so early in life because in my project building, you know, it might be a hundred people in that building. Yes. So you might have a preacher above you or <laughs> a, a drug dealer beside you or pimp to your left, but right? it's all kind of characters, a stick up kid. So you have seen every kind of character and everybody's trying to hustle and sell something. And I just always said, man, I just want to be myself, right? What's meant for me is gonna, gonna come, and 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 what's not is not. And so each time I, I speak to a young man, I try to sell them on, you know, the the overall development and the totality of becoming a man first and foremost. I try to sell their parents on that, um, and I tell them this is not a four year commitment or one or two year commitment. This is a lifetime mm -hmm. commitment, you know, um, because that's what I really got into this for. Quan, it's like I, I didn't. I never dreamt about being a coach, man. I was just such a broken kid that I had people that sacrificed and planted seeds that within that that they wouldn't think would grow to this point, but they watered it and nurtured it. And so I just got into it for the same reason. So that's what I try to sell to them. Look, man, this is a, a, a relationship that's going to be a lifetime. Anytime you need me, I'm going to be here. You're gonna walk in a boy, you're gonna leave a man. And I'm, my main thing is to teach you and give you the principles of manhood that's gonna allow you to be a great husband, a great father, um, a great leader of your community, a great head of household, um, a great son, a great friend, just a man of integrity and those things. And as you know, basketball is a perfect metaphor to teach those life lessons. Mm -hmm. So we do it through life and we compete and we try to get after it. But, you know, we won a lot of championships and I love championships. Don't get me wrong, man. But when people that you coached invite you to their wedding mm. and when people that you coached named their child, their, their middle name is Lavelle, like that's heavy, right? Wow. You know what I'm saying? Like that's the, that's the payoff because when we leave this earth, I don't think God care about how many championships you won, right? It's the impact that, that you're making on these young men. We're kind of getting away from that because this money, mm. you know, has corrupted the sport, right? And I, I, said, I told somebody the other day, man, um, with all due respect, basketball, college basketball, college athletics in general, in particular basketball, it reminds me of the crack epidemic when it hit in my neighborhood. Mm. Right. Our, our projects was a great place. Right. We could leave our door open. We could go next door and, and borrow ketchup and syrup or sugar, <laughs> whatever, from our next door neighbor. Right. If our lights was off, we would run an extension cord from the, <laughs> the living room. Nah. Like, it was a great place. Carl. And then when crack came, it became the wild, wild west. Yes. And now there was no more morals. There was no more values. There was no more integrity. Mm. There was no more trust. There was no more loyalty. Right. So you're constantly looking over your shoulder and you're thinking this person trying to harm you and that person trying to harm you. And it's just everything is corrupt. And that's what's happening now. Everything is corrupt. Right. The players don't trust the coaches. Coaches don't trust the players. Loyalty is no longer a word that we honor. And I'm like, good gracious. At times I look and I see like, wow, what what's going on here? 
And everybody's just chasing the bag, chasing the bag, chasing the bag, because they think that's the end all to be all. And I'm not mad at them getting it. It's just the process and the values and the moral compass of going to get it leads to corruption. Mm -hmm. And you and I both know that, right? And so I'm all for these young men getting paid. I just think we got to find a better system yeah. that in, that sustains the integrity and the moral clause of what this game was founded under. If not, they're no longer student athletes. They're semi-pros, right? And so you got to treat them as those adults once they start taking this bag and being corrupt. And I'm just like, man, you know, like I know, Quans, all of this is about relationships anyway. Yes. So 10 years from now, yeah, you got this bag, but that little money gone, right? That that little money so so fast gone. So now what are the relationships that you developed along the way? And you and I both know the, the value of what a coach can come back and do for mm. you, a phone call that he can make, right? Because we know everybody. We're in contact with everyone, right? And so it's those things that these young men and their crew and their support system don't understand. Yeah. And so that's the frustration. But, hey, we keep chopping wood every single day, man, trying to trying to do God's will. Now, Phil, but that, that I want to piggyback off that because I was going to say oftentimes – you, you know as well as I do, at 18, you don't know what you know. So right. some of these, these decisions these young men are making are based on people giving them advice, and sometimes that advice is bad advice so they can get some money. So how right. do you help that kid when you're talking to him and you know, hey, man, I, I'm trying to get you this information. How do you get in between that, that wedge? I don't think you can get in between that wedge, mm. right? I think you just got to give them the information. And – the one thing about it, God gives us all free will, yes. right? So who are we to stop the free will of somebody else? But we've, gave them, we've given them that information. Mm. And so if I, I've lost kids and they've come back in a year or two and said, man, I'm sorry, coach, because you was exactly <laughs> right. And that's all you can do, right? Because once you take the quote unquote bag, yes. are you making this decision? This is not a lifelong decision. So most kids are taking that bag on the front end and, and sacrificing the back end of it. So honestly, and I hate to keep going back to this, but it's, 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 it's what I know is who I am. It's no different than when I was young and I was 13 and somebody asking me to sell drugs. Yes. And I'm like, no, nah, I'm going to stay in school, man. I'm going to be, do I take the short money and go out there on the block and get four, 500 to take this package down three more mm. blocks and be paid and have a car and nothing? Or... Do I trust myself and bet on myself in the long run? Because in basketball, it's about the fit in the system. And every kid is competing every single day, practicing every day, working out every single day to go become one of the top 450 basketball players in the world. Mm -hmm. If they fall short, they fall short. But that's the goal. In order to do that, you have to put yourself in the best system for you where you can develop and flourish once those bright lights hit you. If you go sell out and take the bag, yeah, you'll be you'll be financially more secure, but you'll still be miserable inside because you're not fulfilling your purpose. And so when that eligibility is up mm. and you've transferred and you're 20 hours short of graduation, <laughs> now you got to go back to the block where you were from. And now you're no better than the guy that dropped out in 10th grade who now – has his own plumbing company or his own trade or whatever it is. And everybody thought you were going to be the man, but you went and blew it because you were just chasing the bag and you transferred, transferred, transferred. And every time you transferred, you lost credits and now you ain't never graduated. So now what coach do you go to to get help? Who's going to pay for your 25 credit hours? Mm -hmm. Nobody. <laughs> right. Because when you went and got that bag, you gave, you told him to kiss your butt on the way out. See? So This is what they don't think about. And this is why I'm saying, like, look, man, at the end of the day, it takes what it takes. It's only going to be the 1% yes. that going to make it to that next level, yes. right? There's a million dudes trying to get, you and I both know, because we've been there, 35 spots. They're going to draft 60, <laughs> but ain't but 35 going to make it. You know what I'm saying? And you could be the baddest of the bad, man. I led the nation in scoring. You know what I'm saying? And, and I had an under-table promise. Like, it's, it's what it is, right? And there's a lot of – fortune that comes into that decision. If yes. not, you can still go make a honest living overseas yes. and take care of your mother and so on and so forth. But the relationships that you miss out on is what people don't factor into this equation. When a kid transfers multiple times and he's no longer on track to graduate and he's exhausted his eligibility, nobody's writing articles on that kid. Mm -mm. 
right? No, no fake Twitter followers is acting like, or these casual basketball fans, they're not acting like they're pro student athletes when that kid got to go back home to his block, right? Now his support system, they vanish because now they out here hunting for the next 13 year old to go back and try to do the same thing because they want to benefit from an ultimate payoff. So you know how it go. These fake on quote unquote handlers, these uncles, mm. all of these guys, it's really pedophilia behavior in a sense because they're preying on these kids yes. and telling them something that they know is not going to benefit this kid. And the kid don't know any better. Kids are kids. Like you said, they, they don't know what they don't know. And a lot of these moms, they prey on single moms too because mm. they don't have the information. As a as a basketball coach, it's, it's wild, Quan. As a, I got a 10-year-old son, whatever it's worth, he's <laughs> a number one player in, in North Carolina. I don't know how you factor that in. <laughs> whatever, right? But he, he's, a, he's a pretty decent basketball player. No AAU coaches and nobody approaches me telling me what I should do for him. Yes. Because they know they can't run that game on me. Yes. If that kid was the kid of a single mom, he'll have them all lined up with broken promises and bags and, yo, know, I can do this, I can do that. And so, like, I, I see it all the time. And I'm like, good gracious, it's so hard to compete against. Even at his level, at his age, there are kids that's been on 15 teams in three years. <laughs> at 10 years old, man. They're just running and running and running, right? And so now what happens when you get to high school? You're going to run again, right? I'm sure even when you was coaching, it was, it was rare that you recruited a kid that had one high school on his transcript, right? It became like two or three. So now what happens when you get to college in the first sign of adversity? Yes. You're running. And then what happens when you become a husband, right? You and I both know we love our wives to death, but it ain't easy all the time. Now you're going to run. Right, <laughs> it's always somebody running. Like so, it's easier. I have, and we'll get into it. I'm sure. I have a single mother's event, man, and yes. the, 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 the. I never, when I first did it, I just did it because I was honoring single moms like my mom, and I didn't think I could find a hundred women. So I had a hundred women, and I was like, I don't know if I can do it the next year because I don't know if I have a hundred women. The next year it was 125 women. Mm. Now we're in our ninth year. We had 216 women that we honored this year. And I was like, the craziest thing is, and I told my team, I said, these women are here because some man ran yes. away from their responsibilities. Yes. And I said, they, they're they not bad dudes. They just ran when they was 30 because they ran when they was 25. And they ran when they were 25 because they ran when they were 20. And they ran when they were 20 because they ran when they was 15. Mm. They ran when they was 15 because they ran when they was 10. So the lesson is like, it's going to take what it takes, man. And, and life is tough, right? And it's, it's, it's 90, it's 10% what happens, but 90% how you respond. And this is the approach that Cheney and Katie and um, Nolan Richardson and John Thompson, George Ravelin, these, why these guys were so important, man, mm -hmm. because they was teaching you life skills to, to couple with your basketball ability that will help you become a bigger and better man and be prepared for this world because we're not preparing these kids mm -mm. for this world anymore. The Bible says train up a child, In a way. right? We're not training these kids no more. We're just, just teaching them. Okay, you do this and giving them insight and it's, it's tough. So it's tough to look at as a coach when you know your purpose as a coach and you know your reasoning for becoming a coach, right? This is it's tough because again, it's the wild, wild west now. Mm. It's, and there's no more rules. So, Vail, so now with all that, and that's great insight, but I'm going to go back to then how do you help if you had advice? Because you have 200 plus moms that you have your program with. So how do you help single parent moms around the country with advice? Because, again, if I'm a mom, I'm working two jobs trying to make ends meet. I got to trust somebody with my child. How do I know what to look for? That's a great question, man. Years ago, I wrote a book. Um the worst times are the best times. Mm. And I honestly, it was just a therapeutic uh, memoir to myself, honestly. I ain't wanted to be a bestseller. That wasn't <laughs> my purpose. That book becoming, it, that, that book ended up becoming one of the bestsellers in our state, particularly among single moms. Wow. Like that, that was the target demographic that was buying that book. And it was like, I want to know 
what did you go through as a young man and how do I deal with my young men? And it's tough, Quans, and I, I will always say this. It takes it's, it's, it takes a village. Yes. Mm. It, ta- it takes a village, right? And so it takes boys clubs. It takes mentors. It takes after school funding. Um, the majority of the problems that teens endure occur during the hours of 3 p.m. and 6. You and I were latchkey kids, so I'm sure when mm-hmm. we beat our moms home, right? And so grandma always said, um, uh, 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 idle time is a devil's playground, yes. right? So that those hours from 3 to 6 now, you things can happen. That could derail your life, right? Because mama ain't home. And so now... Maybe you got a little cute girl in the hood and her mama ain't home neither. Mm, mm, and eventually you like her, she like you and y'all kids and y'all get up and y'all do some adult things that you're not supposed to do. And now y'all two kids having another kid mm, and the cycle mm, continues, mm. right? So it's, it's important for mothers to number one, do a background check. Just like, you know, women, when they date, they do all the extensive background check on the yes. dude that they're dating. Do the same extensive background check with the dude that's saying he wants to be in your child's life. What's his resume? Forget the fact that he worked with kids, right? Like, no. What's his resume? Did he did he play college basketball, right? Did he did he play professional basketball? Has he ever even played basketball? <laughs> what what is he gonna do that's gonna help you so much? And why do you want to serve and assist my child so much, right? So I think that's the number one thing a parent has to do is not. Well, mother in particular, not fall for the the banana in the tailpipe, right? They they just fall for the macking approach, and that's what these dudes do. And before you know it, they got all these broken promises that they're going to do something in particular for their child. Number two, so it's, it's so much information out there. Ask questions. Surround yourself. If you're in North Carolina, there are coaches at high school in the collegiate level that you can ask questions for. It's emails. You got all access to state coaches now. You know, like I know, right? I even, 50 of my emails a day is from people that I don't even know asking for advice or asking for help and assistance from their child. So I just think you have to be resourceful if you're a single mom and do your homework and do your own personal investigation to see. You may not know the knowledge of basketball, but you do have the intuition yes. as a woman to know if this dude is right or wrong for your mom. Yeah. For your for your son, pardon me, right? And that's what my mom did. Like my mom interviewed everybody. She, my mom, don't know a double dribble f- from a travel right now. If you pick it up and run, she'd be like, "Go, baby, go." She don't know, <laughs> you know what I'm saying? But I was fortunate because I had a guy by the name of Ron Williams at the boys' yeah. club that she trusted, and she she had a meeting with. She said, "I'm giving my child to you. I don't know nothing about basketball." She said, uh, "Don't hurt my baby and take care of my baby." That was it. That's all she said. Right. And I don't know what that meant because he used to put hands on us and all that. <laughs> right, sorry. But he raised me to be a man. And he taught me the principles of manhood. Yeah. And so they don't make them like that anymore, Quans. It's like everybody has an agenda yes. to get with these kids because the buyout is so heavy and expensive and so lucrative that everybody wants 1% of this 200 million these kids are getting. Vel. We, we talked about the mothers, and you do a great job with the mothers. Why are the men running from responsibility? That's a good one, man. Um, you know, I think it's, I think it's twofold. Um, had an interesting conversation one time in the barbershop, man, and it, it kind of, I was like, whoa. Um, I told someone, and I told my wife, I've been getting my hair cut since I was five years old. I heard a lot of conversations in the barbershop. But one conversation I never heard in my life is how cool it is to be married. Mm. I never heard that. I heard how cool you are if you had a lot of women. I heard how cool it is to have a lot of money. I heard how cool it is to be fly and have X, Y, Z, X, Y, Z. But I never heard how cool it is to be married. And so I honestly think a lot of young men and grown men aren't even mentally pursuing that route to have a a family, right? Social media 
if you include that into it, it's a devil that we've never dealt with. Mm. And every day, if you look at it, it's a gender war between our people, our communities. Yes. Right. So we're not even friends. We don't love each other. If mm. if I want to if I want to go viral, all I got to do, man, women should pay for every day <laughs> and just tweet that. Yeah. And they're going to go crazy. Well, you ain't nothing. You ain't nothing. Well, you shouldn't take us to this. Like, and that's where we are with this. Then the other aspect of it, Quans, is that I, I my my three best friends are, are females, are women. For, mm. for we've been best friends for thirty six years. Two of them aren't are not married. One of them is. So I've been trying to help them, and I told them I said you got to be careful. And she 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 was like why? And I said, do you know who the richest woman in the world is? And she said, uh, uh-uh. I said, I think it's um, Mackenzie Bezos. I said, you know who that is? She said, yeah, that's Jeff Bezos' wife. Mm-hmm. I said, right. So when y'all sharing these memes, dudes are looking like, wow, why would I sign up for that? Mm-hmm. I said, you got to understand, it's no different than the credit card company that was outside of our, um, on campus in college, ready to give you a credit card <laughs> and some free money, yeah. right? So I said, would you sign up for a credit card that said, okay, your first year is 0% interest, but after the second year, um, if you miss a payment, it's 50% interest rate. And she was like, nah. I said, so that's why guys don't get married. Because after the second year, if we miss a payment or whatever in a marriage, we lose our child, we lose mm-hmm. our home, we lose everything that we worked for, and you get 50% of it. So conceptually, that's not a contract that we should even mm-hmm. commit ourselves to. Mm-hmm. So if it don't work out, it's not in our favor. Yeah. And 80% of these divorce rates have shown us it's not going to work out. Exactly. And so the older we become, the more jaded we become because now enter the social media effect and so on and so forth. And she's been hurt and he's been hurt and they just can't get it together. And so it's like, man, uh, what do I do? Right. And so it ain't that he don't want to take care of his responsibility. There's a lot of things in his, his pathway and I, all this, we all just a sum total of our life experiences, yes. right? And I was, I was so pissed at my father for years, right? And it's a hurt that I, I don't think I've ever gotten over. But when I looked at it further, my father left me when I was four years old, right? And I was like, that's all I remember. Like it was, I said to myself, I, and I blamed myself. So I had security issues mm. because I was like, man, it would be, I could handle it more if he just was never there. And as opposed to me seeing him and now he leave. You see what I'm saying? Like that's a pain I never got over. But I realized my father left me cause his father left him. And his father left him cause his father left him. So it's a generational curse that's never, that, that continues and recycles itself in our community. So that's why everything that I do within our community it's really centered around the restoration of the black family yes. again, because without the black family, we're not going to have the black community. Yes. Without the black community, we're not going to have a united front to stand up for anything. And that's what we are now as a people. Like we, we don't have no code of conduct. We don't have no culture. We allow things to happen. And after two weeks, when it's no longer a trending topic, we're not upset mm-hmm. anymore. Right. And so it's sad, man. It, it, it just broke my heart. Three days ago, a kid got killed in our community. Right, man, I, I was struggling with that. Like, right, because I was like, oh, gone. I could have implemented a program that saved this kid, 14 year old kid that got stabbed and killed. You see what I'm saying? And so, again, those hours of three and six, we're not even occupying these times for these young men. They just getting out, and young women, they just getting out of school and now where do they go? So they don't have that. So it's a, it's a loaded answer. And I think one effect. One cause affects everything else, mm-hmm. right? And it's something that we got to take a deep, dark look at, man, and like really address these issues that's going on in our communities, man, because if we want to save our, our people and save our race and save our community, we have to be honest with ourselves and do some self inventory. Mm-hmm. Well, you, you're a couple wins away from being the all time leader in wins at North Carolina Central. Congratulations on that. But my question is, you're also a household name in college basketball, and that's all levels, so it doesn't matter. So I want people to be clear, that's all levels, your household name. 
So why did you choose to stay when people were knocking at your door? Another great question, man. Um, <clears throat> and I'll tell you, I, I've, I've never told anybody, I've never told anybody this in my life. Um, 2013, um, we have a really good team. I think we're 22 and nine. A kid that I recruited was from my neighborhood. His name is Pooby Chapman. I used to look up, I used to be a kid and go to St. Augustine's College and watch his father play. Um, he had the best handles I had ever seen in my life. So I was really close to the family, his mom. And before he signed with North Carolina Central, his mom, Jackie Davis, looked me in my face while I'm in her living room. And she said, Val, your name is always in these rumors about, mm -hmm. you know, you leaving and so on and so forth. And Kwanzaa, I'm saying you went through that too, right? <laughs> He's like, your name is always, and she's like, look, you just promised me that you stay here with my baby for four years. Mm -hmm. And I said, Jack, I promise you I'll stay with your baby for four years. His junior year, I get a call from a from a Power Five school, mid high mid-major Power Five school. They offer me $750,000 base salary, and with the supplement income, it's going to be a million. And... I turned it down. Mm. And the, the reason I turned it down, I, my thought process wouldn't even get to the next step because I, I looked that kid and his mom in the face and promised him I would stay with him through the duration of his college career. And he was a senior. We came, He came back and we won the championship. All right. And so two years later, another kid mom tells me the same thing and I, I hit her with the same promise. Two years after him, another kid mom comes and I hit her with the same promise. So what I've done is I stopped promising parents that because I owe it to myself and my family yeah. to not explore, but look at other yeah. opportunities if they do present themselves, because that's just the biz. That's just what happens with everyone in corporate America in professional settings. My loyalty, and it goes back to my upbringing, that project kid where loyalty was everything. It was your bond. It was your integrity. Like you don't break your word for nobody. And so I, I held my hat to that. And that's the reason I stayed at North Carolina Central for so long. Mm -hmm. I couldn't even get to the next step of processing anything else because I had promised mm -hmm. Pooby Chapman and his mama, Jackie Davis, that I would never leave. And I remember her saying, Vail, please don't leave my baby. Make sure you stay with him the four years. And I was like, okay, I got you. I ain't think no opportunity would be, you know, presenting itself where it's going to quad five times your salary quads. Like, who turning that down? <laughs> you know what I'm saying? So I knew it was a bigger purpose, you know, when I when I committed and, and stayed despite of all those things. Well, I can safely say North Carolina Central is a better place because you stayed there. And again, I respect for you do what you need to do for you and your family. But I want to ask you a question. I want you to be as raw as you can get because it's all good, man. Mm -hmm. How do you look at guys like me that's not in the HBCU but have opportunities to do that? How do you look at guys like that? And just say me, for example. I ain't putting nobody else out talking to me. How do you look at that? Man, I've, I've always, Quans, I, I, I've, I've always, and it's not just because I'm on this thing with you. I'm on this thing out of the respect that I have for you, how much I revere you. And it ain't got nothing to do with a basketball coach. It's just the man that you are, Thank right? You. you know how it is in our business. 350 coaches, two or three of them may be your friend, right? That. It's, it's what it is. Everybody else is, I don't want to say snakes, but, you know, everybody else envy or jealous or, you know, whatever it may be. So people like you who look like me, who's a tad bit older that has more experiences, that's pretty much taking the same route. That I, I, I remember being a kid watching you at Purdue, man, like on ESPN nights, mm -hmm. like you and Big Dog and like y'all – we were North Carolina kids. We we had tobacco road, but mm -hmm. like, yo, who is this dude out here guarding like that? Who's mm -hmm. shooting that rock like that? Like, so I always had a healthy and tremendous respect because you you inspired me. Man, thank you. And I was a project kid. 
it was hard to find inspiration, man. Mm. <laughs> so seeing somebody on that television screen, like people don't understand that. So I always admired you. And then what you went through after your playing career and, and how you maintain and sustain your faith. And then seeing you grow and blossom into one of the top coaches in the country. Mm. Then now I'm stealing some of your stuff. <laughs> now I got to steal some plays from you. But then seeing all of this thing come full circle and seeing how you, a man of faith, and seeing your beautiful wife in the interview that you guys had, it was it was mesmerizing. Yeah, you sure hit me on that. You hit me after. <laughs> it was it was mesmerizing. Right, because I'm watching wives don't get the credit that they deserve, man. 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 We Quans, we spend so much more time with other people's kids <laughs> than our own. And they out here raising these babies. And they making <sighs> these babies making honor roll and everybody looking at me giving me credit. Boy, boy, you show raising. Yeah, yeah, I appreciate it. <laughs> like, man, they ain't done nothing. Boy, they ain't participated in a spelling bee. <laughs> I'm a great father man. and I try to be, but good Lord, man, I went and I try to go ha have lunch with my kids and all of that. My daughter's in high school, so she don't want me nowhere near her. <laughs> but now my son, he in fifth grade, man, I, I went to, to bring him lunch the other day and the teacher was like, Hey coach. Um, I said, Hey, she, uh, I said, I'm here for, for Lavelle. She's like, what, what class is he in? <laughs> I said, um, <laughs> He said, who class is he in? I said, um, man, um I said, uh, he in fifth grade. She was like, hold on, I'll look it up. Then I took him to the doctor last week. He was like, man, um, when the last time he had this shot? I'm like, hold on, man, let me call his mom. I ain't know what shot the boy had. So I'm like, man, I'm getting all this hype as a great father. But these women, man, they hold this thing wow. down, man. And they, not only do they hold that down, they deal with us. Yes. Right. And so they and then they deal with the outside world on the criticism and the chat mm. uh, mm. being chastised. And man, do you know how strong these women have to be? And we take that for granted so much, man, because we're locked in and they let us live because they want us to be the best version of ourselves. Right. And some of the stuff they hear and see and know, they don't even bring to us see. because they want us to be the best version of ourselves. So seeing you and your wife on that podcast talk to each other as if you you were on a it, it, rem, it was almost like y'all was on a first. Yeah, it was on a second date, but you was going back. Giving first date reviews mm -hmm. and it was a long first date. And he was like, hey, so what you think about this? And how did it feel? Because it was almost like you were asking questions over the years that you hadn't even thought about yes. until God removed you from what you've always done mm -hmm. and gave you some thinking time. You see what I'm saying? And so that's the big picture of it, Quans. And so to answer your question, bro, I respect you so much, man. And because you a solid dude, you mm -hmm. are who you are if you are on this podcast, if we're on this phone, if we had a Final Four coaches meeting, if we're in front of 65,000 competing, you are who you are. In this business, what you don't see is what you get from people. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. And I have a difficult time relating to people like that because I'm not cut like that. I'm not built like that. What you see is what you get with me. You know what I'm saying? And I'm not asking people to get be like me. I just had to find individuals that possess shared values because that's what friendships and all of those things is about. And you have those shared values. And that's why I've always been a long time admirer, a fan, and just a supporter of anything that you're going to do, man, because as they say, you're a real one, bro. Mm -hmm. Thank you. That means, that means the world to me, man. That, that I got to keep going. I, I, Cause I, I have a tendency to get a little emotional I, and I'm, I'm not yeah, afraid. Me too, man. I, I'm this, not this afraid is, of you know, it. Thing gets spiritual sometime, yeah, man. I mean, that's it's, the only way yeah. because again, we only have one life to live, man. And I've, I've watched your success, and, and again, you've done it at a high level. And, and once people hear this, and they'll continue to follow you. More people follow. Hadn't heard of you, but you've done it at a high level for a long time, under the radar, so to speak. And and I think you spend more time in the community and making sure the community is growing. Because again, I you remember I called you years ago about uh, your program with the single moms. I called you years ago trying to figure out how do I need to do this and. 
for yeah. people that don't understand, that's not an easy thing. It's a time and a commitment. So you've taken the time and a commitment to do it. Mm -hmm. And I'm sitting there thinking like, this man has done this at a high level. He's winning at a high level. He's developing talented players. He has his family, has his son, his daughter right there every step of the way. And it's like, man, you've, mm -hmm. you've done that thing. And now you, you've taken that. So I'm hopeful. Well, you, you already get what God has afforded. You'll continue to get that. I'm hopeful, and I'm saying this and respectfully, that you never leave there because you've done so much in the community, and, and I'm not sure if anybody can duplicate what you've done because right. your, your soul, you, you, you've planted your soul in the sand, and you're not going anywhere. Right. So it just from a coaching standpoint, all those young men, because the beautiful thing, and I tell people all the time, if you love, you have energy, you care, you teach these young men, you never have to look at the scoreboard because you're already winning in life. And I right, think that's right. the thing that you're doing. You, you, so that's 13 plus men, all your scholarship guys and all the guys that's not on scholarship, that's 13 guys every year. You or have many four or five, you produce and every year successful men. So we become a better city, state, community, and country because all them young dudes you produce wow. and they become men. And I think for you, the, the, the veil mode and give back, you constantly giving back. And it's like, man, and that's why I say all the time, I feel bad in some areas that, I have to do more because you're doing this at a high level and, and you don't flinch behind it and you keep pushing forward. You stay present. You stay locked in. You stay in the community. And it just, man, that is, if, if we all can do this as coaches and we, because sometimes guys can get so consumed with money, if we can spend time and, and nurture our respective communities that we're in as coaches, this would be a so much better place in country. Man, you hit the nail on the head, man. Um... And I appreciate that, man. Quans, it's um I won a Pepsi hot shot competition when I was eleven years old. Um I only entered the the contest because they told me I get a two liter Pepsi if I win. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just keeping it a buck. I entered the contest and I win the city championship. The next week I gotta go shoot at the state, I win that. The next week I gotta go shoot in Atlanta for the Southeast region, and I win that. Man. Then I shoot on TV, national TV, at the Bullets and the Bulls game, and I win that. I'm the hot shot champion. Wow. When I come back home, they got the hood got a big parade and all this for me, whatever. I look at my grandma, God rest her soul, and I said, uh, Grandma, the light bulb went off. Um, I'm going to take this basketball, and I'm going to, buy you this big house and this nice fancy car. Mm. She looked me dead in my face and she said, I want you to understand something. She said, that's fine and dandy. She said, um, the two most important days of your life is the day that you were born and the day that you figure out why. Mm. She said, when you leave this earth, if people remember you as a basketball player, then you've done a poor job of living. Mm -hmm. I was 11 years old when she told me that. Mm. And I didn't know what that meant, but it stuck with me until I was able to figure it out. So now when people ask me, why do you do so much? Because so much was done for me, right? I, it, it was nothing utopian about <laughs> my childhood. <laughs> like is in Boston, my, my Orchard Park project, they based a movie off that project called New Jack City. Mm. So my pain was everyone else's entertainment. Mm. Then when I moved to the projects in Raleigh, that won't eat, you know what I'm saying? That won't even better. In 40 years, six kids from my project went to school, went to college. Six. And two was from under my mom's roof. You see what I'm saying? So it was crazy out here. And I was the kid doing the inception of the crack cocaine and I'm going crazy. Like it's 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 wild, right? And you got so much trauma and all of this, but every day I walk out my house, I had to make a life or death decision to get back in it. Mm. Right? Because of the things that existed outside. And any times there's illegal activity in your neighborhood, then that means it's illegal guns. And I tell people all the time, like, man, you got to understand, when y'all watch the news from 6 o'clock to 618, it's nothing but crimes, right? And they talking about this happened, this happened, this happened. Well, all those people that commit those crimes, when they get out of jail, where did you think they were going? They came and lived back in my neighborhood. Mm. That's where the halfway houses is. That's where the lunatics were. That's where the people with the convicted felons. So being a kid trying to navigate through that, man, that was that was crazy. Mm -hmm. So now every program that I developed with my Vail Cares Foundation, I said from day one, 
Because we've been at it for 17 years. I said, man, I don't want to just put my name on something like these rich people do and just show up and, and take credit. Like, nah. So I started the single mother's event, right? And it, it, all of it's so personal because that's my mom, right? I saw her daily challenges as a single mom. So we probably give away over ninety five, a hundred thousand dollars worth of prizes to single moms each year. It's a red carpet event, great dinner. Um, last year we gave everyone laptops. Um, they get pictures and dinner and gift cards and vacations. Um, there was a lady who um, she just couldn't sustain work because she didn't have reliable transportation. So we bought a minivan for her and her four kids. Right, like that's what it's about, right? And so we have a back to school community day giveaway that we do. Um, that's probably the 17th, 18th year. And so for people who don't know myself, PJ Tucker, Nate McMillan, John Wall, Devontae Graham, TJ Warren, we're all from the same place. Mm. Like not the same city, the same place. Like, so I could throw a rock and hit John house. John could throw a rock and hit PJ house. PJ could throw a rock and hit Nate house. So we, I've been doing that for 17 years, and the reason I do the back-to-school giveaway, it ain't just backpacks. It's the school supplies, right? Because I was ashamed when I was a kid. I had a, I'll never forget, I had a chemistry teacher embarrass me in front of the entire class mm. because I couldn't afford a scientific notation calculator. I would never ask my mom for one. I could just work the answers out, but I couldn't ask my mom for that because them things were like $55, $60 in 1992. I couldn't afford it, right? So... I put those calculators and school supplies in those bags. We Every kid get a fresh haircut so he can be incentivized about learning. The young ladies, they get their hair done and they get their nails and done so they can look and feel good so they can be incentivized about learning. They get their backpacks. They get all the school supplies. Well, mama ain't never got to buy no school supply throughout that year. And now they're incentivized about learning. And myself and PJ gave them 700 pairs of shoes. It's probably 1,400 people out there each year. So we had 700 pairs of shoes. And so I do that because I wasn't a kid that could afford the latest and best shoes going back to school. My mom struggled to get me and my brother a haircut, right? That was that was tapping into some stuff. Rent had to be delayed for that. You know what I'm saying? And so she did the best that she could. So I wanted to eliminate those challenges from those from those parents and those kids, man. Um, you know, so that's some of the things that we do. We we doing I partner with Google. Right. You know, like Quans, you meet these amazing mm -hmm. people in these roles. Right. Everybody loves basketball. So I partnered with the vice president of Google and one of the reps, Tia McLaurin, and they was trying to implement a program. And my good friend, shout out to David Banner. He always told me, man, he said, yo, it's hard to lead the people if you can't feed the people. That's and I true. never forget that. Wow. Right. And so um, I partnered with Google and. I told them I want to, you know, help them implement this certification program. So now it's a certification program where it's probably six to eight month, months. It's self-paced. And once you complete the program, you'll be certified in areas of like program management, data analysts, uh, IT design, mm -hmm. WebEx design, all that type stuff. Right. And then you get employment. And so they said we need help implementing this program. And I was like, it's a great program. Y'all ain't. You know, there's like, I said, how many people are you trying to get? They said 100. I said, man, if I post this and take this on the head, like, you'll have way more than 100. Exactly. Quans, in, in, in two hours, we have 483 people. <laughs> so I said, y'all got to make sure all these people have scholarships and so on and so forth. And so up to this point, we've been able to uh, create 216 employment opportunities here in RTP <sighs> through that program. So these people are now making eighty five to $94,000. Right. It, maybe they wanted a career change. Maybe they got in trouble when they were 16 and had a misdemeanor. They couldn't afford to go to college. And now they're 19 and they want a career change. Well, Research Triangle Park Raleigh, in Raleigh, North Carolina, has essentially become the Silicon Valley of the South. Wow. It's 500 Fortune 500 companies here. So mm -hmm. 10 minutes from North Carolina Central, Duke, Chapel Hill, it's, it's 500 Fortune 500 companies here. You got Amazon, Cree, Lenovo, Cisco, Red Hat. Nike, Amazon, Google, they coming. So we to give our people an opportunity to advance, we did that. Every every month I go into the school system and I recognize a teacher for their hard work, dedication, right? Because Quan's outside of your family, if I ask you who had the most impact on your life, you're going to say either a teacher or a coach. Exactly. Right? And a lot of times our favorite teachers didn't even know they were our favorite teachers. Yeah. <laughs> So now I was like, man, this is such a thankless job. They're so underpaid. And what they're dealing with now, you know, every day on the Internet, it's a teacher. They got to fight a kid or being disrespected. 
So I go in and, and I go into the school systems and I promote the teachers to give them some incentive to continue to do what they do with our young people, right? Because your kids went through school. My kids are in school right now, man. Like, this, it's an amazing job. And I just think it's one of the biggest hypocrisies where we say our education is the most important thing, but we pay our educators the least amount. Exactly. That don't make sense. No. You know what I'm saying? No. Like, y'all ain't got no more money to get these people. Like, stop playing, man. And so I've been there and done it. So my foundation, I try to target everyone that's in the community. And then a couple of years ago, me and my boys, we was like, look, this gentrification is happening. Let's create a Riley Ray. Let's let's create a develop construction development company. And this is big time, right? They coach. did it, man. They did it. So I was like, man, let's do it. And so we started building affordable housing mm. in our community. So we're on our fourth affordable housing project. Thus far, we've built um, two hundred and eighteen units. We got other units coming, and it's true affordable housing, man. Like where these people can stay in their communities and don't have to be bought out and head elsewhere and migrate to the suburbs and so on and so forth, right? Because for generations, their uncles or aunts or grandmas or mothers own those homes. Our soul is in those communities. So in order to preserve our history in those communities, we must remain in those communities. Instead of selling that house to somebody who migrates from Albuquerque, New Mexico, that's just going to be here for two years, like that's how you lose your soul, right? And so... Those stories need to be supported and told. But again, the most basic fundamental component of life and humanity is just having a roof over your head. Yes. And so that's why I was like, man, I just want to put a roof over these people here. Why? Because I know what it's like to have pressure where mama may not can't pay this rent this month. So for everything that I am now, I honestly feel like God just touched me, man, and just said, listen, bro. You a hot mess when you were younger, so I'm, I'm going to do you this one. Just stay with me. I'm going to follow you. I'm going to let you be a coach because I know you wouldn't work in a pie factory. I'm going to let you stay around the game. But in return, you got to do this for me too. Amen. I honestly feel like that's the agreement between me and God. Amen. And I, he's allowed incredible people to come in my life where it's not exhausting to me. It's a lot of work, but anything is a lot of work. But I don't have a vice. I don't go out. Yeah. I don't drink. I don't smoke cigars. Like, I'm the most boring individual you'll ever meet. I play golf, right? So I always have time. I'm up at 4 30 in the morning. Mm-hmm. So, just that hour and a half before everyone wakes up, I can devote to my Veil Kids Foundation without it taking away from yeah. my life, my marriage, my team, my whatever, because I'm always going to keep the main thing the main thing. But it's been truly a blessing to support a community that's always supported me since I was 10, 11 years old. Hey Amen. My my, this has been a classroom, man. Miss Hattie, she's done a phenomenal job when she raised you, man. My my last question, man, and I I just want you, you speaking to me and my family, but you're also speaking to a, a lot of young men and women, African American, black families, and and if others, if they choose. My daughter's 16 years old. She's a junior in high school. We're looking at HBCUs amongst other schools. What's the benefit of going to an HBCU? That's beautiful, man. Um, you know, Quarles, I, I'll say this. This world has convinced us that our education is the great equalizer and it's the most important thing in this world. And 90% of that is true. What I figured out in life is the education of yourself, knowing who you are, is the most important thing in this world. Mm-hmm. HBCUs allow you to do that. Um, no disrespect to any other school or anyone else, but HBCU, and in particular, I'm talking about North Carolina Central, it taught me about who I was. Um, it taught me my origin. It taught me exactly where I come from. It taught me about exactly who I am. I'll be honest, I was an honor roll student in middle school, high school, on the dean's list at North Carolina Central. At 49 years old right now, ain't nobody ever asked me to square root or nothing. <laughs> Man. <laughs> you know what I'm nobody asked me about the square root of nothing or 
how to solve the Pythagorean theory or thing. N- none of that stuff matters, right? Um, what mattered is black experiences before 1865, mm. black experiences after 1865. A lot of black people in this world miss out because they're not properly educated about themselves nor mm. their history. If if I looked at your history book in high school, I think we took U.S. history in 10th, 11th grade, 300 page book. You only learned about five black people. And that was a page apiece. Mm. So what happens when you look at that is that you learn about who Harriet Tubman, um, Martin Luther King. They give you two pages on Martin Luther King. Don't really tell you the truth about him. Um, you might get some Jackie Robinson. Um, you might get some Jesse Jackson or, mm. you know, uh, it, it, it's, it's really rare. You might do some Hank Aaron cause he broke the baseball record. <laughs> like that, that's, that's, that's your history. So if I'm a black kid in a history class in high school right now, and I'm looking at a 300 page book and I only see five black people in it in my mind, it's like, Whoa, so only five people that look like me had a major contribution to America. Now, if I'm a white kid or any a kid of another race, I'm looking like, hmm. So the other 295 pages are about my people. Yes. So both of them are being miseducated. One has an arrogance that she, he or she shouldn't have, and another one has, you know, an insecurity that he or she shouldn't have. If they really told the truth, then they would have a better understanding and they would have a better understanding and now they could understand each other better. Yes. But a lot of it is just sheer ignorant, arrogance because they've been miseducated. So this, this kid is feeling insecure and don't have the right to feel that way. And this kid is feeling arrogant and don't have the right to feel that way. And so the world just continues to resurface these behaviors. And that's why some people act the way they act. Black people would feel much better about math and science if they knew they invented it. Yes. Wow. You see what I'm saying? Like, our young black kids, they would be like, man, damn, I hate math. And they would love it if they knew they invented it. Mm. If they really knew the value of those pyramids. It's the only thing that's never been destroyed and built with hands mm. by mm. us. Mm. Right? If they knew the richest man to ever walk the face of the earth was Mensa Musa, yes. the wealthiest man to ever walk the face of the earth, they would understand that. If they knew about Marcus Garvey, if they knew about Fred Hampton, if they knew about Fred Preach. Douglas, if they knew about Stokely Carmichael, if they knew about mm-hmm. Mega Evers, if they knew about, if they really knew why the Black Panther Party was created, and not only us, but them too. You know what I'm saying? It would just be that education is so valuable, but you can't receive that education unless you are willing to know about oneself. And now when you walk across that stage, you can walk head high, chest high, because not only am I responsible for understanding, and not only do I now know the history of my people, I know who I am. I know who I come from. So it's hard for us to navigate through this world when we don't even know where we come from Mm -hmm. as a people, as a unit, right? And so that's why we always throw our degrees in people's face. Man, what you talking about? I got, like, man, I got a PhD. Man, that stuff don't matter. Mm -hmm. Who Mm -hmm. are you? You follow what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. And so now, it's important to teach whatever we teach our kids, we're keep teaching our kids, kids. And so now they can go back and teach those same history lessons. But a lot of people can't teach those lessons because they never knew. So now when our communities, when you see the division, we're no longer united about nothing anymore. Mm-hmm. Right? We ain't stand, we ain't, st- we say we standing on business, but it's individual business. We ain't, man, people kill our kids, we don't do nothing. People, <laughs> look at the music. Well, look at the music, right? It's, it's, it's hurtful. Like, l- look at the propaganda. Look at the, why does every female rapper got to be butt ne- butterball naked mm. rapping? No disrespect to them. Where's the UNITY? Where's the Queen mm-hmm. Latifahs? Mm-hmm. Where's, the, where's the representation for young black girls like that we have? Who's going to teach them? Who's going to educate them? Part of the reason black families are being destroyed is the music. We're not talking about love no more. We came up in the time, look, the the craziest, most violent person in my neighborhood would walk down the street listening to Freddie Jackson, you are my lady. <laughs> He'll knock your head off, 
but still had the, the boom box. And he played Freddie Jackson, You Are My Lady, all day and sung it to the top of his lungs. On that radio, it was Babyface, it was Luther, it was New Edition, it was Ready for the World. Every song was about love. We called the radio station, hey man, uh, can you play Can You Stay in the Rain for Keisha? Tell her it's from there. Tell her I'm thinking about like this. We had love. We we had love implemented in us, man. These kids, it ain't no more love. It ain't cool. You a simp now if you say you like a girl. Mm -hmm. You a simp. So uh, it goes back to the other question you asked. Like my mind ain't even set on having a family one day. Quans, I had a plan, man. Like I had, I don't know, and I, I feel like I'm crazy now or just OCD now that I'm older because I thought everybody was doing it. Mm -hmm. Man, I used to get Jet Magazine and look at page 43 to see the beauty of the week. <laughs> and I was, I was, I was piecing my wife together from 12 years old. And I knew I was going to have a boy and a girl. I knew my son was going to play ball. I, I knew my daughter was going to run over me or whatever. <laughs> man, I had this plan yes. planned out. But this was, when I got to college, I looked, man, girl asked me, what you do? I'm, I'm in college now, but I'm going to the NBA, so you better get on now. If you, whatever. <laughs> I just had the plan. I had everything set and established. Broke as a joke. Ain't had no money. Ain't have a, two, a quarter to rub together. But that was my plan. These kids don't have no plan. And the sad part about it is they don't have dreams. When you don't have mm. dreams, you don't have a purpose. Mm. And when you don't have a purpose, you become miserable. And that's why so much of this generation is depressed because they ain't got no reason to wake up and fight the world every day. And if you ain't got a reason to wake up and fight this world, then what are you here for? And that's what it is. So these kids don't even dream no more. <laughs> They don't even know. They they don't even dream. I had dreams and still have them. You know what I'm saying? So it's 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 a large part of that, man. And so HBCUs taught me how to dream. It taught me how to dream. It taught me what I wanted to become. It taught me to have a plan that was greater than myself and plant some seeds for trees that I would never see grow. That's what HBCUs taught me because it was done for me. I don't think you get that experience, no disrespect to anyone. I don't think you can get that experience at a at a PWI. Every Duke is five minutes away from us. Me and Grant Hill are the best of friends to this day. Cause we were the best of friends in 1994. Cause he spent them two hours on Duke campus. But boy, the mother 22, he was over here getting this coach. <laughs> Shout out to Grant Elton Brand, Ricky Price, uh, Elton. Yeah. Everybody, Trajan Landing, uh, Jason Tatum, boy, yeah, they're carrying indoors two hours away. But when they got off that flow, boy, they over here getting this Kyrie, they getting this coach over here, right? Same thing with all the Carolina boys, Jerry Stackhouse, Rashid, Donald, all them boys, Jeff McGinnis, Touche. Man, me and those guys are best friends to this day because they was like, man, something was missing. It was, mm -hmm. you know, it's something that was missing. It's, it's something they got to create cultural groups on the campus of PWIs for you to even fill apart. You ain't got to, it's a cultural group out here every day that lets you know exactly who you are. <laughs> right. And it's, it's such a beautiful thing, man. It's, it's a, it's, it's the most surreal experience. And, and the other thing I'll add lastly is that the diversity amongst our people is we're not, we're not an individual group of people. Like it's, man, it's, it's crazy. And we all accept each other for, I can see a girl to this day walk across campus and say, oh, she's from D.C. I can see a dude from New York yes. walking across. Yes. But, yo, he's he from New York. Yes. Yes, sure. I don't mean from New York. Yo, he from, talk to him for two seconds. Oh, he from Cali. Yes. Where you from? Yes. You from Cali? You know what I'm saying? Yep. So just being able to, implement those cultures, right? You just learn so much about our people. And then you talk to somebody enough, long enough, it might be your cousin, you don't yeah. even know. Yeah. You see what I'm saying? And so that's the beautiful thing about it, man. So when you come home, you have a totality to, of an education. You got your history, you got your math, you got your science, got your criminal justice or whatever you gonna major in. But more than anything, you got your history about yourself mm -hmm. and understanding of who you are.
But when I walked away from North Carolina Central, man, I walked away with no no regrets. It's the best decision I ever made in my life. And I ain't even make it. God made it for me because I had never seen the campus. Never. It all counts family. We just got a lesson on life, love, learning, yeah. together, family, parenting, education, black history, American history. Uh, this has been a phenomenal, phenomenal, I'm going to say podcast, but it was really a class. Uh, oh, it all counts family. Let's continue to grow together. Make sure you like, share, and subscribe, and bring somebody along with you. Again, we had the phenomenal teacher slash basketball coach, Lavelle Poetry and Moten. Thank you, man. Man, love you so much, man. God bless you. I'm grateful to be on. Give your wife, your your babies, man. Give them all the hugs. Tell your daughter, go ahead and keep keep taking it. Out your pockets, because that's all my daughter. <laughs> They're the most expensive individuals I ever seen in my life. Oh, they get so so as long as I'm getting got, you gotta get got too. I hope your baby want the, the new white Range Rover hey. fresh. The hundred and twenty thousand one. Yeah, get a baby, cause daddy got it. <laughs> she get me, man. I appreciate you, man. It's been great, man. And, and I hopefully I see you soon. Always, boy. Hit me yeah. if you need Take me. Take care, boss. man. Yep. My brother. All right. Love.